Go ahead and uh, turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 14. That's where we've been studying for a while. We take our time. Um, We'll be starting in verse 51 today. Mark chapter 14, verse 51, and reading through verse 65. Kind of a lot. Kind of a large section for us today, huh? We'll see what we do with it. Verse 51. This is the verse you've been waiting for. Now a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body, and the young men laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Now I, I'm really tempted just to do the whole sermon on this passage. <laughs> it's, it's... Keep going. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. But Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Then they began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, Prophesy. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. Would you pray with me, please? Uh, God, this is your word. Um, We we come to it placing ourselves under it, uh, wanting only the truth that you want to present to your servants. Um, We ask for you to teach through the sermon that I've prepared. Uh, We pray that we would have the right hearts uh, as we encounter uh, the sufferings of Christ. Many encountered it. Few had the right heart about it. Uh, So we pray that you would soften us, that you would... um, Let us be ready to be taught the hard things of your word. And and again, we ask, God, that you would would be forming us into the image of Christ, Uh, that that we who have been made in the image of God would now fulfill that, what you've begun, and that we would become more like Christ in our understanding of the things of God. Please teach us today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so um, verse... 51. Yeah, verse 50, if you recall, or you could look back and see what it says in verse 50 in your Bibles. It says, all forsook him and fled. Um, When you think of all, if you know the story, what the the setting is and everything, then you probably think of the 11 disciples, right? 12 minus Judas equals 11. Um, But there was another. There was this other guy. And Mark mentions another one, not one of the 12. Mark is the only gospel that mentions this uh, young man. Now, I'm, yeah, it's, it's uh, an interesting section because it's just like, oh, yeah, that, that one story about the naked guy. You know, it's not, it's not one you hear preached on a whole lot. Um, I doubt you've ever heard a sermon on these two verses. You know, what was last week's sermon again? Oh, yeah, streaking in the spirit or something like that. I don't, I don't know, that naked guy running away. Um, And it it does seem a a, a bit humorous at first, but this really is a a bit of a mystery, and I I like to look into mysteries. Verse 51 says, A certain young man followed him. It does not give his name. He is not one of the disciples. Um, Why would any of the disciples just be out on the Mount of Olives in their bathrobe, having, you know, just had dinner with Jesus? It's not one of the the twelve. It's worth considering why anyone would be out at night on the Mount of Olives in just one, you know, piece of linen. And there's an interesting theory about this one uh, that has been held by some as, uh, as early as you know, the church fathers, you know, in the early centuries of the church. Most scholars, ancient and modern, suspect that this guy is none other than John Mark, the author of the gospel we've been studying. 
you'll notice as you read through the four gospels that the authors of those gospels don't mention themselves in the spotlight, but they often do leave an autograph. Um, if, if they speak of themselves, it will be in the third person. In John's gospel, you see this uh, especially. John refers to himself as the disciple Jesus loved. And then at the end of the book, he gives it away that, oh, I'm also the author of this book, John. That, that's me, by the way. And he lets, it, he lets uh, the secret out uh, by the end of the gospel. So many people believe that this strange piece of information about the guy running away is Mark's little signature just to let people know, hey, I was there. I was there. He would have been a young man at this time, and we also know that his family lived in Jerusalem. So all of that makes sense. All of that would fit. Uh, but what, what would we be doing without all of his clothes on? Like, that's another mystery, isn't it? And why wasn't he mentioned as going out with the disciples? Only Jesus and the 11 went up, but this guy is running away. Did he meet them there? How, how'd this happen? Well, it seems like this guy wasn't actually with the, the 12 disciples or the 11, but followed Jesus afterwards, apparently in a hurry, such a hurry that he couldn't finish getting dressed. And here's where more of the theory gets interesting, and it is just a theory, but it makes a lot of sense. Many people suppose that the house where Jesus and his disciples had eaten Passover was at the house of John Mark's family. We have biblical um, support for this theory. In Acts chapter 12, verse 12, it says that the disciples were used to meeting at the home of John Mark's mother, which was in Jerusalem. They were used to, and they would go there often, frequently. It could be the same house. If this were the case, it may be that Judas and his army of thugs, we read about them last week, came first to Mark's home because that is where Judas had left Jesus. You remember he was going to betray Christ. And if they get there first, when Jesus and his, or Judas and his guys, excuse me, come and, and found them gone, um, it would have been easy for Judas to suppose that they went up Gethsemane because Jesus and the disciples were used to going there. So, when Judas and his group started out for Gethsemane, we can imagine a young John Mark hurriedly uh, getting, putting something on, you know, just got out of the bath, and running to Gethsemane to beat Judas and his army so he could warn Jesus. It's possible. Just possible. Just an idea. I think this is a reasonable theory, though. If you have a better one, let me know. And the point is, at the end of verse 52, Jesus had, has been abandoned by all of his friends. He has suffered in prayer. We read about that last week. Uh, he has suffered alone. Um, all his friends have abandoned them. He's suffered betrayal by a friend. Judas had betrayed him with a kiss. And now we get to uh, verse 53. And they, that is the, the mob that Judas brought, and they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. Um... Mark doesn't record the, the, the prelim trial um, that Jesus had at the house of Annas. That's recorded for you in John 18. And he doesn't include the official daylight trial the next morning uh, in front of the Sanhedrin. But he does record this first illegal court that was held um, at the home of Caiaphas, the high priest, the, the acting high priest, who had invited the Sanhedrin to his place, the council, the elders, the scribes, etc., to make this trial um, happen, this trial that we're going to read in Mark, to make it happen, there are all sorts of laws being broken. Uh, it's an illegal trial in, in every way you can imagine. There were many Jewish laws that served to protect the rights of the accused, Jesus in this case, but they are bent or deliberately broken so that Jesus could be condemned to death. Um, the mob mentality wasn't contained by the mob that arrested Jesus. It was being driven by these men, uh, the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. Now, this should be evident already as we remember the nature of Jesus' arrest. It was an illegal arrest. He was arrested by the order of men who had bribed another man to betray him. So you, you can't really imagine these judges as being impartial, not even close. Uh, I'd like to, you to, to remind you what these gentlemen are like real quick. The last time we saw the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes all together was in chapter 11. When they came to him in 1128 and, and they said, by what authority are you doing these things? And then Jesus asked them about authority. <laughs> um, 
and Jesus told them in a subtle way that his authority was from God and theirs was not. And then he told them a story in chapter 12 about wicked employees who murder their master's son. That was a story about the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. Now they are functioning on stolen authority to illegally condemn an illegally arrested innocent man to death. That's what's going on here. Verse 54, but Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at fire, at the fire. A couple interesting things on this one. Peter was close. Uh, Peter followed Jesus. He's close, but he's not too close. You know, um, he is following Jesus. He has a desire to see what becomes of him. Um, in the end, you know, and he cares a, enough to follow, but more than 10 other disciples, um, John was there as well, but he also cared a whole lot for his personal safety. And we, I don't want to be too hard on him, but we do see a problem here because yes, Peter was one of the closest disciples to Jesus at this point, but he was still much, much too far away. Um, there's a trial going on and Peter is there. And we know from John's gospel uh, that he would have had ample opportunity. Excuse me. Um, we know from John's gospel that John is there with Peter. Uh, we know that both of them would have had opportunity to be the good witnesses at the trial to speak up in favor of the innocent, uh, which would have been a required um, happening in a legal trial, actually. Uh, but we see them keep their mouths closed. And we see a terrible thing happen with Peter. Uh, we'll look at this more next week, but it says that he sat with the servants. Now, Matthew says that he sat with the guards. It mentions him warming his hands by a fire that they had kindled. Now, where had the guards of the priest just been? Arresting Jesus. By distancing himself from Jesus for purely practical reasons of self-preservation, of course, he made himself nearer to the enemies of Jesus. Um... You might not like this part. <laughs> uh, Christianity is polarized. It is polarized. Matthew 20, or excuse me, Matthew 12, verse 30 says, whoever is not with me is against me. Jesus said that. Okay, I'm not making this stuff up. Jesus said that. James chapter four, verse four says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Um, I don't think Peter wanted to be Christ's enemy. We don't want to be Christ's enemies, but when we distance ourselves from him, even if it's just to save face somehow and identify ourselves, or excuse me, we will by default identify ourselves with this world rather than the world to come. We're certainly not acting like his friends, are we? Uh, remember Psalm 1 a famous psalm. Peter is now sitting in the seat of mockers, something Psalm 1 warns against. What will happen uh, next, we'll see, um, see more next week, but I don't want you to forget that he's here. He's here and he's distanced himself from Christ. And now by doing that, he has identified himself with Christ's enemies. Through the end of this chapter, we'll be following Peter. We'll look at the denial of Christ, his denial of Christ. But we're not done with this verse. This verse gives us some hel other helpful information. It says that they were in the courtyard of the high priest. In other words, they were not at the court. So they're not at the courthouse. They're in the courtyard. And those are two very different things. Um, they're in the high priest's home. Courtyard's your, your yard. This was completely illegal. Again, to bring the accused to the priest's home in the dead of night, does this look anything like an impartial trial? Uh, all of this was illegal according to Hebrew law, their own law, the Mishnah, which is the Jewish collection of, of laws and commenta commentaries. It says, let a capital offense be tried during the day, but suspended at night. In other words, if you're going to try and kill the guy, you can't do it at night. Duh. Okay, another law stated that an accused man was never subjected to private or secret examination, which if it's in his house at night, that seems kind of secret to me. These are their own laws that they are breaking, but the trial goes on. Verse 55. Now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Verse 56. For many bore witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. So once Jesus is brought before these men, 
who made up the Sanhedrin, which would be like the Supreme Court, basically, um, the supreme ruling body in Jewish culture, they had a problem. He, they, they arrested him, which is great. Okay, you know, knock one up for the bad guys team. Um, but they've got a problem now because it wasn't the Sanhedrin's job to bring up a charge against a criminal. Um, you know, the judge and the prosecuting attorney are not the same person. That, that's a little sketchy, right? The judge is also not like the, the arresting officer. Uh, they're not allowed to do that. But in this case, they're all just mixed in into one messy mess. Um, you know, they, they're not judges, but because uh, judges aren't uh, the ones to arrest people. But the, the 19th century uh, Hebrew scholar Alfred Edersheim, who I quote sometimes, he said that the, San, the Sanhedrin did not and could not originate charges. Um, they couldn't bring forth the charges. That had to be someone else. So they brought Jesus there, but they can't say what he did wrong because he didn't do anything wrong. But they, have, they sought charges, it says. They sought charges. They wanted someone else to bring charges against him. Like, we've got him here. Someone accuse him of something. Let's do this. Okay, all the bad things he's ever done. Just someone shout it out. We need something to go from here. Um, and again, this doesn't even look like a fair fight. Um, what kind of judge brings out an illegally arrested man and says, okay, I want to hear all the bad stuff about this guy. Please, can anyone please give me a good reason to condemn this man? It was also illegal because in a, um, in a, a court case like this, the evidence in defense of the accused was, was to be heard first. You had to hear two witnesses first in the man's defense and then the rest of it, which they don't make any attempts to follow that law. If it wasn't so tragic, it would seem comical uh, to see the lengths that the enemies go to kill Jesus. You know, I mean, they're, they're trying really hard here. And as you read all this, it's, all, it's almost hard to believe they were able to pull it off. It's like, really? Like you, 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 and you pretended like this was legal? Like, how did you do this? You mess up at everything you do. But you have to remember that this, this wasn't their idea originally. There were powers that were govern governing these events that were unseen. And really, on the one, on the one side, you have de demonic influences running strong. Jesus had said that this was now the time of evil. Men who you might think um, would have you know, seen how ridiculous this illegal trial was, they were now convinced that it was a good idea, and they all vote, let's kill him. Impartial judges were being tempted to become partial, and in a few hours, mild-mannered Jewish peasants would become a bloodthirsty mob calling out, crucify him. Okay? Happens fast. In this chaos, there was a satanic influence, no doubt. But Satan wasn't in charge. The father of lies could only produce what we see here in verse 56, confusion. You know, it's hard to come up with a lie twice in a row the same way. Um, people tried to come up with reasons for Christ's death, but they couldn't agree. They couldn't do it. The reason all of this goes through, um, you know, as it did, was not because the priests were clever, though I guess you could say they were. And the reason it goes, you know, the reason Christ is crucified is not because Satan was powerful, though he is. The reason for the trial, the mistrial, uh, the cross, the reason for that is because Jesus laid down his life for his friends. There's someone in charge in this story, and it's none of these characters in, in the courthouse. It's the one being tried. The reason for this is because Jesus laid down his life for his friends. Who's the one in charge of this story? It's the innocent man on trial. Don't forget that. In verse 57, it says, Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another temple another made without hands. Okay, this accusation, of course, isn't entirely true. Uh, Jesus had said that he would destroy the temple, and he spoke of the temple of his body. Um, the phrase, I will destroy the temple made with hands, is never uttered by Jesus. So they, they misquote him right off the bat. Um, probably because of this inaccuracy, the testimonies on, those, on this count don't agree. So one person said it, and the other person said it differently, and they're like, well, we can't even really use this. Um, it's hard to have two people tell the same lie. It really is. If they had been able to pull it off, this would have been a very serious charge. They were trying to make Jesus out as a terrorist uh, who wanted to, to destroy the temple. Now, this would have been a serious offense of, uh, offense, of course, but they couldn't even convince this court that so badly wanted to be convinced 
that Jesus was a terrorist. They just couldn't pull that one off. So, so since they couldn't get a straight story out of anybody, because you have to have two or more witnesses, so like none of these things match. We can't get something to stick on this guy. They have Jesus testify at his own trial. Okay. Now this is probably a last ditch effort. You know, the chief priest had been beaten time and time again by Jesus in arguments. They knew how dangerous it was to let the truth open his mouth in a trial that is based on lies. Like that's risky, but they were desperate. So they try the old catch him in his words game again. Verse 60, and the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus saying, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? Now on this, this action itself is just really interesting because the priest is losing it, right? He's running out of options here. And so he gets up out of his judgment seat and goes towards Jesus, wants to do some eye to eye intimidation stuff, you know? And on this action um, of the priest, uh, Charles Spurgeon had something interesting to say. He said, it was a, tac uh, <clears throat> a tacit confession that Christ had been proved innocent up till then. Meaning everyone had to accept that he was innocent until proven guilty. So they hadn't been able to do anything. The high priest would not have needed to draw something out of the accused one if there had been sufficient material against him elsewhere. The trial had been a dead failure up to that point, and he knew it and was red with rage. Now he attempts to bully the prisoner that he may extract some declaration from him, which may save all further trouble of witnesses and in the matter. Okay, so the, the priest gets up, he questions Jesus in the first part of verse 61. It just says, and he kept silent and answered nothing. That's Jesus's response. The priest didn't really ask him anything. I mean, there was no good question in the priest's, you know, barrage, his attack. Um, he was hoping that Jesus would just give him something to work with. Jesus didn't even open his mouth. This, along with everything else that had been hap already happening on this terrible night, was a fulfillment of scripture. Isaiah 53 verse 7 prophesies of Jesus some 700 years before his birth. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Jesus did not answer the priest. Now, why not? Um, I'll tell you a couple of reasons. Matthew 7 verse 6, Jesus says, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under feet and turn and tear you in pieces. What could Jesus say that would make this man repent? What could Jesus say that hadn't already been said to willing ears, um, but his heart had been hardened? Jesus says nothing because Jesus wasn't there to defend himself. Here's the other reason he kept silent. He wasn't there to prove his innocence. He was there to die. That's why he was there. He was there to experience exactly what he was experiencing, humiliation and punishment. The trial wasn't an accident. This was part of what Jesus was born for. Now, he doesn't answer the priest until the priest asks a question worth answering. Verse 61, uh, the rest of it. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? There's a good question. It's a direct question, and it's a question that proves to us that those who would condemn Jesus knew exactly what they were doing. They were killing the Christ, and they knew it. No one thought that Jesus was just a good teacher or a hippie that held lambs, okay? No one <laughs> believes that. These men knew exactly what Jesus was, and they knew that he was dangerous, and they knew they wanted to kill him. The priest doesn't say son of God here because the priest ironically was trying to appear holy and not misuse the name of God, referring to him as the blessed. Uh, but in verse 62, Jesus, he answers. Jesus said, I am, and you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. How about that? Does it get any more clear than that? Jesus is asked, are you the son of God? And Jesus says, Yes. He says, I am, which is better than saying yes. yes. Other gospels record Jesus as saying, you say that I am. 
Uh, again, pointing out that the priest knew exactly what he was doing when he was condemning the Son of God to death. Jesus says, you just confessed it. You said I am. You, you, you know I'm the Son of God. Yes, of course I am. They knew what they were doing, but Jesus still doesn't, he doesn't stop at a simple confession. It was a yes or no answer. He doesn't give a yes or no. He says, I am. Saying that he was the Christ would have been enough to seal his fate. But Jesus goes further. He says to Caiaphas, the high priest, looking him in the eye, I imagine, he says, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Now, the power is, again, used uh, instead of the name God um, uh, in the same way that the blessed was used. Jesus says that Caiaphas will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God coming with the clouds of heaven. Now, Jesus is quoting scripture to the high priest which is always a little kind of, you know, something to smirk at a little bit. Uh, the scripture he's quoting is from Daniel chapter 7, and we've looked at it before in our study in Mark. It is a prophecy concerning Jesus Christ. I'll read some of this prophecy to you from Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. It says, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days, that's God, was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. Then in verse 13 of Daniel 7, it says, I watched in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him, that is the Son of Man, to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Now, always know that when Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man, this is what he's thinking of. This is what he's talking about. This thing's been bothering me the whole time. There we go. Should have done that a long time ago. When Jesus refers himself, to himself as the son of man, he's not saying, I'm just like you. We're just humans, you know, and stuff. He's saying, no, I am the Messiah who God himself grants an everlasting authority and I will rule with an iron fist. That's the son of man. It is a, me it is a messianic title prophesying of the day when when he will rule, when Christ will rule every living creature with complete and eternal power and authority. When the priest asks if Jesus is the Christ, Jesus reminds him of what, what kind of Christ he is. Jesus reminds him of Daniel chapter 7 and says, in essence, I am the Christ, and as you know, Caiaphas, the Christ will rule for all eternity over every soul. And I'm telling you, Caiaphas, you will see me coming on those clouds ready to rule my planet. Now, I don't, want, I don't want you to get the idea that Jesus is anything less than humble here. He's not trash talking, okay? But I do believe that this statement left no room for speculation as to who was in charge of this situation. If there was ever a time for the high priest to repent, it was now. We know from studying the scripture that, that when Jesus does come to rule, he comes to judge. We know that every soul who has ever lived will one day be resurrected in order to be judged. Read Revelation chapter 20. Jesus is that judge. On that day, Jesus, who was judged, ironically, by a group of self-righteous criminals, will judge those same self-righteous criminals. The Sanhedrin is judging their judge. And they are reminded of this by Christ's powerful statement. They're reminded of who's, who's really in charge here. Now, I know the word judge, it's come on some hard times. Um, people don't, don't want to be judged. That's something you'll hear a lot. No one likes the person who is too judgmental. And even Miley Cyrus sings that only God can judge me. Well, Miley, you might want to remember that. He will. <laughs> um, but, but really, no one likes the word judge. And I get it because it is completely true that we are, it is not our job to condemn people. And those two words have kind of become synonymously, synonymous, unfortunately. 
Um, it is not our job to condemn anyone, but we are to know that w- our friend, Jesus, is also our judge. He is the same. He gets to determine whether your actions are right or wrong. And he is the judge who can say, I forgive you. This whole situation with the priests, is, it's ironic since the judge is the one on trial. And since, if you think about it, this, would, this was really the trial of the Sanhedrin, you see that it wasn't so successful after all, was it? The San, would they accept the king or kill him? The test was on, you know, on their plates, really. It was their trial. They were the ones being tried and they failed. The answer Jesus gives, which would have brought, which should have brought his accusers to their knees, riles them up and they fail the test. Verse 63. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, what further need do we have of witnesses? The crowd goes wild. Okay. The high priest heard what he needed to hear. The Sanhedrin heard what they needed to hear. In a well-ordered court, each member would have cast their vote one at a time. But at this point in time, it seems that there was just a loud outcry. The high priest, in melodramatic fashion, tears his robes, his official robes, I believe, which would have been something that was done only in the most disastrous of occasions. This is actually really interesting because this is another illegal action. According to Leviticus 21.10, the high priest was not allowed to rip his clothes. It was against the law. He wasn't allowed to do it. And it is very interesting that the priest's clothes were so symbolic of the righteousness of God. Look at Exodus chapter 28 and 29. And we actually just studied it in Exodus. It's in chapter 39. Um, A priest's clothes were such a huge part of their ministry. When a normal Jew would, look, would, uh, would hear blasphemy and tear his clothes, he would never sew them back up. That was an official statement saying this is a tragedy that can never be mended. Now at this point in time, Caiaphas is tearing his priestly garments and according to their own traditions, he was not allowed to sew them back up. Now we, we, we know that it was not his intent to be this symbolic, but think about it. He is casting off the priesthood before the true great high priest. And we see in this instant the, f- the failure of the, the Aaronic priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, in both genetics and in accurate representation of God. And it's all crumbling before the Lord. It was the end of the priesthood right then. It's over. And it's, it ended because Jesus Christ is the priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The only the only one who could be a priest after this guy was Jesus. And he cleaned up even that priesthood by replacing it. This guy tore his clothes. He caused another riot. It says, you know, everyone got mad. Everyone wanted to kill him. The only dissenters among this crowd would have been Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, who we'll see in chapter 15. Uh, This is, again, another illegality, if that's a word, in the trial. Remember, the members of of the Sanhedrin weren't supposed to bring charges against anyone, right? They were to be impartial judges. But the final accusation really comes from the high priest himself. He brings the charge against Jesus to his colleagues. He asks them, what do you think? I've presented my case. Well, it's not your job to present cases. And the Sanhedrin minus two agrees that Jesus deserves death. And this is still another illegal ruling. The Sanhedrin wasn't allowed to decide on matters concerning capital punishment on a single day. They had to sleep on it and the decisions... Uh, on that decision and then decide the next day. And this is what their laws said. The Mishnah, uh, that's the Hebrew law. It says a criminal case resulting in the acquittal of the accused may terminate the same day on which the trial began. But if the sentence of death is to be pronounced, it cannot be concluded before the following day. And yet we see here that Jesus is condemned and the roosters aren't even crowing yet. An illegal trial being held at night at the home of the high priest on the eve of the Sabbath That was illegal too, by the way. Passing the death sentence on a man illegally arrested and given no defense. The law required that evidence in favor of the innocent party by two or more witnesses be brought prior to the accusation, prior to the, uh, you know, the the conflicting um, evidence. And that didn't happen. 
As his accusers were placing themselves above God, they naturally attempted to place themselves above the law of God. And from there, it goes downhill. In verse 65, um, we'll actually read from verse 63 all the way down. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, what further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, prophesy. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. And so the beatings begin. Um, if we're not already there, um, we're coming into a very disturbing portion of scripture. Um, Jesus is good. He's good. Jesus is, is holy and Jesus is loving. And Jesus is an abused victim here. Willing victim. A victim who's in control of the situation, but a victim nonetheless. Uh, if the passage itself, if reading this passage on your own uh, doesn't make you cry, then it makes your blood boil at the injustice of it all. One of those reactions is, is bound to come through. Um, and I, I don't want to play on the emotions too much here, but we do need to see the horrors that exist in this passage. Um, and I'm going to show you what I see as the real horror in this. It wasn't that Jesus was being punished for our sin, though that is always enough to make one pause. It is that the enemies of God made the abuse of God into a game. I don't know if you saw this in the scripture, but have you ever heard of the, the game Blind Man's Bluff? Blind Man's Bluff, right? Uh, it's a game that, that used to be played. You put a blindfold on the one kid in the middle and he has to guess where the other players are and try and tag them or whatever. Um, that's the innocent version. Traditionally, this game is called Blind Man's Buff. Buff, as in buffeting. In the King James Version, you can read that the attackers of Jesus buffeted him. They blindfolded him, and then they hit him. And then they said, guess who hits you? Um, you can probably guess that it hurts about twice as much if you don't see the punch coming. Uh, if you know where it's going to come from, where you're going to be hit, your body can prepare a little bit, but not if you're blindfolded. And I, um, the sufferings, I want to point out that the sufferings Jesus was going through here, it wasn't just the sufferings of the harsh justice of the Romans, the crucifixion that's to come. This wasn't punishment that's going on right here. Um, this was fun. This wasn't their punishment. They weren't carrying out a sentence here. They were just having fun. To me, that's the worst part of the whole thing. And you, you don't always, if you haven't noticed, you don't always get a happy story when you come to church. Uh, but you always get a true story. And you always get one you need to hear. What do you do with a passage like this? Uh, do you just get sad? Because some people are content just to feel something and then leave. It's like, oh, that made me sad. It must have been a good sermon. You know, do you just get mad? Do you get angry? Um, emotions are fine, but emotions, for emotion's sake, is never the goal. You're never just supposed to feel something. You're supposed to do something. And what you do with this passage, this is what you do with this passage. The song we sang today goes like this. Behold, the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders, ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. You behold. That's what you do. You just look. Before Jesus saved you, you might not have thought you would have killed Jesus, but you, you probably would have made fun of him. You probably did. Uh, you may not have driven the nails, though you did. Uh, neither did these men, though. These, these men, they weren't actually crucifying him. They were going to give that dirty work to the Gentiles, right? But they made his sufferings a source of ridicule. What do you do with a passage like this? I'll tell you what you do. You repent. Um, if you're willing to repent, then you will be, you know, it's, hmm. today's the first Sunday of Lent. Did you know that? Any recovering Catholics in our midst? Yeah, there we go. 40, 40 days till uh, Easter from last Wednesday, right? And we're starting to look forward to that. We're starting to look forward to Easter. If you're willing to repent as we're looking at Good Friday, then you'll be ready to rejoice on Easter. 2 Corinthians 7.10, it says that there is a godly sorrow that produces repentance leading to salvation. Now, 
in this story, there's a few different characters, right? There's Peter who follows, uh, but not close enough, associating with the enemies of, of Christ. And then there's ones that just outright mock him. And there's his enemies. There's the, the, the judges, the condemning judges. Now, you need to figure this out. Are you Peter who wants to follow but isn't willing to get up close and personal? If you confess Jesus, then he will confess you before his father and it's worth it. Repent. Don't follow at a distance. There's something you can do with this passage. Christianity is not, is not in need of distant followers. We have plenty. There's no more openings. Do you hear your voice among the scoffers? Then repent. And you know what? Even this, even this centurion who oversaw the crucifixion repented. So repentance is an option. Have you mocked Jesus, spit on him, condemned him in your own heart to death? Listen, repentance is your option. It's the best option. Jesus saves such as these. Paul approved of the murdering of Christians, and uh, Jesus saved him. Jesus saves sinners. The ugly story of the gospel, and it is ugly, it gets better, and it becomes beautiful. I want to be sure you're on the right side of it so that you can see the beauty. So followers, followers of Christ, this is your takeaway. Follow closer. You're not close enough. Follow closer. Mockers, here's your takeaway. Stop it. People, that's all of you. Repent. That's the takeaway. I'm going to pray. We're going to do another song. Pray with me, please. Jesus, we worship you as best we know how. Uh, we thank you for teaching us what you've taught us. We thank you for speaking to our hearts through your scripture. Uh, and we pray, God, that you would assist us in closing the distance between us and you. Um, God, we, we don't want to be, we don't want to be like Peter following at a distance. We certainly don't want to be like anyone else in this story except for you. We want to be like you. God, I pray that you would imprint on our minds and on our hearts a clear image of a suffering Christ. Um, not just so we can feel a certain way, but that our sorrow, if sorrow is what we should have, it would be a sorrow leading to repentance unto salvation. Thank you for your gift of salvation. I thank you for offering us heaven, offering us new life while we live on this earth. And we praise you for it. And we praise you and thank you for what you did to gain those things for us. Bless your church today in Jesus' name. Amen.